Hello, everyone. Welcome to this um, webinar on DCT and hybrid trials for medical devices and uh, diagnostics. Uh, my name is uh, Derek Arts. I am the uh, CEO and founder at Castor, and I'm uh, recording this from, uh, from Amsterdam, where it's a beautiful, sunny day. Um, it's actually been sunny for a while now, so it's, uh, it feels a little bit un-Dutch, um, which is great. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with you and to join you later for, uh, for a live uh, Q&A session. Um, this webinar is, of course, about uh, decentralized clinical trials, and I think you've heard a lot about those uh, in the past year. Um, decentralized clinical trials were a concept that existed far, far before um, the pandemic. Um, one of our advisory board members, Craig Lipset, um, you may be familiar with his name. Um, he worked with Pfizer, uh, you know, a long time ago now to uh, to actually run the first decentralized clinical trial. Um, but it's it was always something that was uh, more on the innovative side and not something that we would typically see in sort of mainstream uh, device development. And with the pandemic, things changed, of course. Suddenly, something that was innovative became strictly necessary. It wasn't actually possible to continue to conduct a clinical trial uh, without incorporating elements into your trial to make them more decentralized or to make them hybrid. Um, and with my company, Castor, uh, we saw the same thing. We, um, we have a very modern platform to conduct clinical trials and, and to capture data from, um, from a variety of, of modalities and um, all the adjacent functions that you would expect from a system like that. Um, and while our system was better suited for, for more hybrid trials, we still felt um, a lot more action was needed uh, to, to help uh, trials continue and to actually make trials more patient-centric, which is something we had always been very excited about from the very beginning. And so, in the past year, um, many companies in the space made sure that they developed capabilities that allowed patients to stay in their home, to reduce the need to come to, uh, to a site for a study visit. Um, and that's great. Uh, you know, I think a lot of these innovations um, were born from necessity, but that doesn't mean the outcome isn't excellent. Right? It's great for patients to have to travel less to a site because they can conduct a televisit from their home or if they can you know, consent from their home. Uh, it's great that we actually can increase access to clinical trials through new technology to make trials more inclusive and to increase diversity in clinical trials and to really ensure uh, these trials represent the, the real patient population uh, much better. And at the same time, um, it is also great for the industry because all these things that I just mentioned um, means it's going to be easier to recruit patients. It's going to be easier to retain patients in clinical trials, making it more attractive uh, to stay in a trial by reducing burden, uh, of course, is an amazing way to make your trial more efficient because you're not losing patients uh, that you've just spent a lot of time recruiting. Um, and I think that's really key. And that's really why I expect the vast uh, majority of all this enthusiasm and innovation uh, to, to stick around and to you know, continue to make a difference. I think 30% of protocols will probably revert back to the old ways for a while, but I think 70% of protocols will probably incorporate some element of um, decentralized trials. Now, I've been saying this a lot, but maybe we should break this down a little bit. What does this mean? What does, um, you know, decentralized mean? Decentralized does not mean pure sightless. Um, or at least I think it shouldn't. Of course, this is his definition question. Um, I think we should be going for hybrid. And so hybrid means that based on the protocol, based on patient needs, based on your patient population, we try to uh, pick an approach that makes sense. And I've taken this image from Acuvia, which they, they had readily available very early in, in, in the pandemic, or maybe before that even, um, where they sort of show how you can move from site-based to home-based. And Clearly, this image shows you that um, that's not a binary thing. It's not all DCT or all um, home-based. Uh, sorry, it's not all site-based or all home-based. It can be in between, and it can also vary per um, what type of activity you're thinking of. Um, and so we can go from on-site clinical assessments to 
fully remote televisits where we have a video interaction with a patient where we um, go through an assessment. We can do paper-based on-site consent, or we can do fully digital remote e-consent, which is on the other um, extreme, which is a capability that Castor has invested a lot in, because I think it's going to be the future of consent. Why not do that from the comfort of a patient's home? Um, we can have a pharmacy hand out um, a study drug or um, an investigator, the device, for example, or we can ship those directly to the patient. We can measure vital signs in a traditional way, or we can have connected devices, ideally through you know, the 2G network, IoT devices, continuously monitoring the device, uh, sorry, monitoring the patient uh, through the device, or maybe the devices you're manufacturing are able to, um, to make that type of connection. Um, we can collect samples in the hospital, or we can send a home health nurse. We can do a paper questionnaire, or, and I think this is something that almost all of you will be very familiar with, uh, we can use ePro or ECOA to conduct questionnaires. Finally, we can um, have patients travel to a site for a follow-up visit, or we can chat with them or interact with them or do that through a televisit. So there's, there's many different axes along we can sort of assess uh, decentralized. And uh, what I've tried to do is, and you know, this is not a source of truth, uh, try to map this to device classes because I'm assuming the audience you know, will be a, a mix of manufacturers of different types of devices, different device classes. And so let me just talk, talk you through this briefly because I think it's interesting to sort of challenge you on, on your thinking because I think almost any uh, trial and any product uh, supports making trials more hybrid. Um, let's start with televisits. I think for class one to class two B, um, hypothetically, you should be able to conduct all uh, your, your visits through televisits. And that's what, what the green check mark means. It's like, would it be feasible to actually um, do everything through a televisit? The orange icon, the plus minus means maybe some of it. So I think for a class three device, you're almost always going to be bound to a site for the initial implementation or the impl you know, initial surgery um, that involves the device. But that doesn't mean you can't do a lot of follow-up visits remotely. Uh, but I, you know, I don't think it would be feasible uh, to do all visits uh, completely remote. Uh, e-consent. I do not see why you couldn't incorporate remote e-consent in every single protocol, because um, usually there's this sort of preamble towards a patient actually being enrolled in a trial or a procedure actually happen, happening. So even if you have an on-site procedure where the device is implanted, it doesn't mean that before that you can actually um, go through the consent procedure remotely. Um, so we could, for example, um, you know, have a traditional enrollment method where a physician speaks to a patient about a trial, gives them a flyer, gives them a website where they can enroll themselves. They, from the comfort of their home, go through the uh, documentation. They go through the uh, enrollment portal, something that Castro also uh, offers. They see the high-level eligibility criteria. They enroll themselves. They fill in a screening questionnaire. Uh, there's an automated assessment. And then the investigator either you know, completely... Um, decentralized at a central site um, or um, at the site itself, uh, assesses the screening questionnaire, sets up a call with the patient, walks through the consent uh, process, and the patient has consented into the process, and then they come to the site. So you basically take away whole activity from the physical interaction, um, and you allow patients to really think and ponder on the, you know, the consent and what, what that pertains to from the comfort of their home. Um, something to think about. Direct to patient shipments, I think for lower class devices, very feasible, class 2A, class 2B, uh, sometimes depends on the device, of course, hard to say. For class three, typically you know, not something you could ship to the patient. Uh, so that's a hard no, um, the way I see it. Then connected devices for, for monitoring. Now, this pertains to the device that we're actually studying. So can we actually connect the device directly into a cloud platform to push data in? Sometimes, but not all devices have connectivity, of course. Um, you know, they're, they're very different types of devices. Um, so that's why it's orange. Although we can, of course, always introduce a connected device into a trial to monitor the patients additionally. So um, there's beautiful IoT devices that can help with remote patient monitoring that don't require a patient hub and that you can just um, it's basically plug and play. And so I would definitely recommend thinking about when you're going to do televisits, also seeing if you can um, involve some remote monitoring activities. Um, 
Home nurses, of course, can almost always be brought in sometimes for every single activity, uh, also including um, you know, getting the patient familiar with the device. I think again, for class three, there's a lot of home nurse can do, but probably not the initial um, uh, sort of implementation or um, installation of the device, if you will. Um, that's why that's orange. I think ECOA and chat, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to uh, do follow-ups and, and get patient reported outcomes, um, the, you know, patient dictionaries, et cetera, in any of these trials. Um, those are not related to the initial um, you know, implementation uh, of the device and therefore I think can be used in any protocol. And I would just say use this to, um, to consider whether you could actually add some of these elements to your protocol, because uh, I think this is a great industry that can really rapidly adopt uh, DCT. And that's what we've seen with our customers. And just a bit more on, on the machine to machine or the 2G network. Um, I think traditionally speaking, there's always a, a hub and there's a you know, Bluetooth process and, and the connection that needs to be made, et cetera, uh, as you can see on the left. But on the right side, the new methodology um, is actually focused on leveraging devices that are directly connected to an IoT network. Um, and this is not something that's new in the world. This is something that's new in the clinical trial industry. And so I, you know, I want to challenge you that perhaps for your own devices that already support 2G for, uh, for whatever reason, or for uh, a companion device to help with patient monitoring, for example, consider um, this new modality because it greatly induce, uh, it increases the um, positive patient experience. And a positive patient experience is absolutely critical to patient retention. So we want to make everything as seamless as possible. So the technology they use should be uh, intuitive, user-friendly. And uh, when it comes to connecting you know, hubs and Bluetooth connections, et cetera, there's always, of course, um, the potential for, uh, for issues. And so I just want to open your eyes to this uh, beautiful um, technology that is already being used extensively in other industries and used in um, industries that uh, also have very strict regulatory requirements. Just something to, um, to challenge you. So what could this look like um, in, um, in the real world? Um, I've taken a particular example. Castor has done an incredible amount of uh, work around COVID. I'm, uh, I'm very proud of the work we have done. Um, We've worked with the World Health Organization. We've worked with a lot of our customers on fully decentralized uh, clinical trials um, from the technology side, that it is. Um, and we've also done the COVID Red Project, which is a, a, a Takeda Roche supported IMI funded uh, project that's running um, in the Netherlands. It's um, also in a collaboration with Eva Women. And in this pro project, we uh, were actually assessing whether a wearable can accurately uh, predict the onset of COVID-19. Um, and what we did here was uh, enrolling these patients um, through a decentralized manner through enrollment portals. So I think that's already a key point, right? Because we greatly increase the access we have to patients by using um, adverts and by using um, you know, publications. We actually had a huge spike, a huge influx of new participants because the national press picked up on this project and published it and we saw um, you know, the number of enrollments just, you know, spring up exponentially. Um, and especially with these types of big studies, which is, this is uh, aiming to enroll 20,000 participants, if I'm, um, I remember correctly. Um, it's, it's great to be able to use technology for, for automated screening and to, uh, to remove the need for travel, et cetera. Um, and so this, this project was able to enroll patients, um, remotely, fully remotely, no size visits. And then, um, for patients who were randomized to the correct group, they shipped the device, um, the AVA device. It's this beautiful looking bracelet you see in the center. Um, direct to patient. So no need for travel, just receive a package at home. It was pre-activated based on the randomization we conducted in platform. So based on the randomization, a certain number came out tied to a certain device that was shipped to the patient and patient is enrolled in the trial. And then we start monitoring them through the device uh, which, of course, you know, this device is uniquely capable of monitoring the patient, and at the same time also taking them through uh, ePro questionnaires, et cetera, using, um, um, using our technology. And um, I think that's a great example of how you can create a fully decentralized medical device-driven uh, trial. Um, it's just one example. There's, there's always uh, new complexities in other projects, 
Um, but I think it's good to read up on these case studies and to really understand uh, how technology can be used uh, effectively to, um, to support these types of activities. Um, because I think ultimately we are now in a new paradigm and there's a lot more acceptance for using direct to patient methodologies. And again, I think ultimately we should all care about optimizing the patient experience and optimizing patient retention and making trials patient centric versus just centered on the outcome, which would be getting high quality data for submission. Of course, that is the critical outcome um, for any sponsor, uh, but ultimately we are creating these devices and, and, and on the other hand, we are creating these drugs to help patients. Um, and I think it's kind of counterintuitive to then not also optimize the experience in the trial itself that ultimately should lead to more patients getting access to this technology. And so I think um, you know, decentralized trials, hybrid trials are made for med device. Um, DCT is an amazing fit or DCT elements are an amazing fit for most device classes. Um, even implantables would allow for mostly in-home trials. As we discussed, um, connected devices can be shipped straight to patients, other devices as well, by the way. Um, connected devices can push data straight into a cloud platform. Um, and you know, remember that also uh, removes the need for source data verification in, uh, in some cases, as we now have an electronic source that um, is uh, generating data. Um, and by ensuring we know what device generated that data, by ensuring we do, you know, store a serial number in the order trail, um, that is very usable data. Um, think about video, the power of video. Video can do so much. It allows you to bring that human connection into a clinical trial. At the same time, also allows you to um, interact with the patient to see if they're using a device correctly, for example, to answer any questions. And I think finally, which is great uh, for the med device space is uh, regulations are slightly different from regulations in drug development. Depending on the type of device you're bringing to market, depending on how many similar devices already are on the market, um, you, you probably have a bit more freedom in, in terms of how you define your protocols and, and, and what elements you incorporate. So I would say take advantage of that because you're going to make your trials more patient-centric. You're going to make them more efficient. Um, and ultimately that's gonna be better for, uh, for everyone. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I just want to end on a, on a note um, with saying for us, it's really important to make sure that we democratize, uh, democratize access to our uh, technology. We want to make sure we really shift the paradigm. We want patient-centric trials to become mainstream. And that means that we want to make sure that everyone can use our technology. It should be self-service, it should be scalable, and um, it should be so easy to use that anyone can use our technology to um, to run these types of trials, because we want to make sure that this doesn't stay in the realm of innovation and of um, very expensive big trials. We would like all trials to be able to use elements to make their trials more patient-centric to maximize the impact of data, because that will mean that we're actually ushering in the next paradigm for clinical research, and Castro is pushing very hard to make that happen. Um, last slide before we end. Um, this is Castor's you know, total overview. We have uh, the platform. Uh, we also have a much broader vision for how uh, we can work together with our customers to leverage data, to work with ecosystem partners. Um, and everything, of course, is powered through an API. So already 70% of our uh, data is um, generated, or sorry, uh, of our web traffic is generated through API calls. And um, I think that's a strong indication of, of how far ahead some of our customers already are. They're using the API very extensively to push data in and out of the platform. Uh, and we are always actively looking for, for partnerships to create a richer ecosystem that is really sort of defining how we are running next generation trials. Um, that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for, for your attention. Happy to answer any questions and um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, that's where I'm most active, not so much on Twitter. I'm um, happy to, uh, to discuss anything afterwards and have a great rest of your day.